All right, so good afternoon. Welcome to the Zoom webinar for the 2020-2021 Notice of Funding Availability for the City of Fresno HUD Entitlement Program. This presentation will cover the application process, eligibility threshold, and federal requirements that apply to most HUD CPD programs. Additional webinars have been scheduled for specific programs, which I know many of you have already enrolled for. And we are joined today by um, Thomas Morgan, Housing and Community Development Manager, Bill Kubal, Consultant for HUD CPD Programs with USANA Development, Austin Robinson, our Consulting Program Manager for CDBG Programs, also with USANA Development, and, um, and I am Edward Shinnevere, Senior Management Analyst with Housing and Community Development. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Tom Morgan, who will do a brief introduction. Good afternoon, and I want to welcome everyone. Uh, we're excited uh, every year at this time, or we're a little bit later this year than previous years uh, because of the five-year consolidated plan process. But we're always excited to put out the net and see what type of new opportunities that we have, that you have, that we can work with as your funding partner. Uh, Bill and Austin and Edward this afternoon will be taking you through many of the things that we're seeking and wanting to do, and we have very little time, so I'm just going to segue directly to the agenda. This afternoon we'll be talking about uh, the programs and the planning overview and the significance of the five-year consolidated plan. I really want to stress the importance of that document because it's too often dismissed. It sets our strategies and priorities for the five years. After that, eligibility threshold and federal requirements under the NOFA, the reimbursement process. Many times people, um, especially first time partners, do not fully appreciate the requirements of the reimbursement process. And we wanna walk you through the most significant of those requirements. And then we'll, uh, before closing with questions and answers, we'll do a walkthrough of the application process. And so with that, I turn the Agenda over to Bill Kubal. Oh no, Edward Schindler. Yep, I'm up next. Thank you, Tom. So we'd like to start the overview today with a bit of an explanation, as Tom indicated, for how we got here. HUD entitlement programs involve robust planning processes, which guide the way investments are made in the community. We'll quickly cover the four entitlement programs and the planning efforts that were conducted for the current annual action plan and consolidated plan. The city of Fresno is an entitlement jurisdiction, which means that it receives funding through four formula grants from the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, commonly referred to as HUD. Formula grants are determined through census and other data that calculates community need according to a complex formula which determines the size of the grant available for the jurisdiction. The size of the grant can increase or decrease based on changes in population, demographics, the number and size of other jurisdictions, and federal funding levels. The funding is provided to primarily benefit low and moderate income persons, though affordable housing and community development. The city operates many programs to meet HUD objectives utilizing these funds, and also makes additional funds available to the community through a Notice of Funding Availability, or a NOFA. This Notice of Funding Availability is the subject of today's conversation. Before we get to the Notice of Funding Availability, we'll quickly cover the four entitlement grants that the city administers as an entitlement jurisdiction. The first and largest is the Community Development Block Grant Program, which funds projects, programs, or services to benefit low and moderate income persons. The CDBG program has the largest list of eligible activities which the city prioritizes through an analysis during the planning process, which includes a robust citizen engagement process. The city uses CDBG funds for infrastructure and facility improvements in low and moderate income neighborhoods, operates a housing rehabilitation program, and operates programs for seniors and youth out of city-owned community and neighborhood centers. Additional funds are made available for eligible organizations to apply for. 
The second program is Home Investment Partnerships, commonly referred to simply as HOME. The HOME program funds affordable housing solutions for low-income persons. The city partners with developers and community development housing organizations to build and rehabilitate affordable housing. Additional funds are available for eligible organ organizations to apply for, namely in this consolidated NOFA process, the funding available is specifically for tenant-based rental assistance or TBRA. The Hearth Emergency Solutions Grant provides funding to benefit homeless persons and persons at risk of homelessness. The city partners with the Fresno Madera Continuum of Care or FMCOC to determine the funding priorities in accordance with the city's plan priorities. The Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS or HAPWA program provides funding for homeless and homeless prevention services for residents with HIV AIDS. Aside from an administrative amount, the full grant amount for both of these programs is made available to eligible applicants to apply for. We'll now talk briefly about the required HUD planning process. This year is a consolidated plan year, which means that the city has just concluded its five-year planning process for the entitlement programs as required by HUD. This has an effect on both this year's priorities and the timeline, which will both be different from it in more recent years that you may have experienced. The 2020 to 2024 consolidated plan was approved by the city council on May 21st, 2020, and sets the priorities for funding over the course of the five years of the plan. As part of the planning process, the annual action plan was also completed. The annual action plan this year does not include specific subrecipient information as it has in years past. Rather, it contains funding at the project level. The project as defined by the annual action plan, however, is a HUD definition of project, which really means something more like project types. Each project which was approved in the annual action plan may include one or more subrecipient activities. Now that the city council has adopted the consolidated plan and annual action plan, we're in the green area on the diagram displayed on the slide. The city issues, issued notices of funding availability or NOFAs on May 22nd, 2020, requesting applications from eligible organizations for activities that meet the objectives of the individual projects approved in the annual action play plan just the day prior. The planning process continues after the awarding of subrecipient agreements with accomplishment reporting back to the city in order to inform the city's progress report to HUD called the CAPER or Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Report. We'll go over the specifics of the application timeline in a bit more detail toward the end of the presentation when we come back to how to apply. But first, um, as discussed earlier, every activity undertaken with HUD entitlement funding must correlate to the priorities determined in the five-year consolidated plan. Since this is a consolidated plan year, We'd like to share the priority statements which were adopted by the City Council on May 21st, 2020. These priority statements were developed in strong consultation with the community. First, provide assistance for the homeless and those at risk of becoming homeless through safe, low barrier shelter options, housing first collaborations, and associated supportive services. Second, Improve access to affordable housing for low income and special needs households by partnering with interested developers to increase development of low income and affordable housing in high opportunity areas and by promoting the preservation and rehabilitation of existing affordable housing units. Third, promote quality of life and neighborhood revitalization through improvements to current public infrastructure and facilities and by closing gaps in areas with aging, lower quality, or non-existent public infrastructure and facilities. Fourth, provide services to low income and special needs households that develop human capital and improve quality of life. Fifth, provide services to residents and housing providers to advance fair housing. And sixth and finally, plan and administer funding for community development, housing, and homelessness activities with improved transparency, 
increased community involvement, and full compliance with federal regulations. While the city has used its entitlement funding for fair housing activities in the past, we're calling it out as a separate priority in the new consolidated plan. Residents were very strongly in favor of more emphasis on fair housing during the planning process. And similarly, we've broken out planning, administration, and compliance as a separate priority for the first time as well. The city feels strongly that compliance needs to be top of mind in administering the funding at all times, and this was also echoed by residents during the community engagement process. As discussed earlier, the activities funded through the NOFA to address each project must align to the priorities determined in the consolidated planning process, whether, developed, uh, whether delivered rather by the city or through subrecipient agreements. Applicants for those activities are the subject of this consolidated NOFA. So this is how we come to today. The city has identified several projects as part of its consolidated plan and annual action plan, which make funding available for eligible organizations to meet the plan priorities. The consolidated NOFA will provide for three application types, owner occupied home repair, homeless and homelessness prevention, and public and community services. We'll be discussing each of these in more detail in the subsequent presentations later today and tomorrow. There are two funding opportunities that are not included in this NOPA process, and those include affordable housing development and substantial rehabilitation and fair housing programs. Each of these will be funded through a separate application process. With that, we will hand it over to our HUD entitlement program experts from USANA Consulting, Bill Kubal and Austin Robinson, who will present considerations that apply to most programs that applicants should be aware of. And with that, uh, Bill, if you've got the, oh, going to Austin first, here we go. Hello, it's uh, Austin Robinson here. Hope you all are doing well today. Uh, first, we're going to go over eligibility threshold and federal requirements. First, for threshold requirements, applying agencies must meet the threshold criteria below. If an agency cannot provide documentation to demonstrate that it's meeting all criteria, the application may not be considered for funding. The applicant must be an eligible entity. The submission of 2020 and 2021 NOFA application Part A and Part B by program must be submitted. It must show consistency with consolidated plan priorities as well as the annual action plan projects. It must qualify as an eligible activity. It must incur eligible expenses and maintain financial and management systems. Moving on, an eligible enti entity is a unit of local government serving program beneficiaries residing in the city of Fresno or a nonprofit corporation that's incorporated in California or incorporated with the state of the United States, District of Columbia or United States territory and also probably registers, registers as a foreign corporation with California's Secretary of State and possesses a 501c3 determination of exempt status. Section 501c3 is a portion of the US Internal Revenue Code that allows federal tax exemption of nonprofit organizations. This is specifically those that are considered public charities, private foundations, or private operating foundations. Moving on, the eligible activities, CDBG funds may be used for include but are not limited to uh, Activities listed below, acquisition of real property, relocation and demolition, rehabilitation of residential and non-residential structures, construction of public facilities and improvements, such as water, sewer facilities, streets, and neighborhood centers, public services within certain limits, activities relating to energy conservation and renewable energy resources, as well as provision of assistance to profit-motivated businesses to carry, it, carry out economic development and job creation, retention activities. The ineligible activities listed in the following slide. Generally, 
following types of activities are ineligible acquisition construction or reconstruction of buildings for the general conduct of government an example of this would be if there was a public facility improvement that was being made on a youth center facility you would have to ensure that the facility or area of repair was used to conduct solely youth services and not house staff um, second there's political activities as well as certain income payments. Income payments means a series of substance type grant payments made to an individual or family for items such as food, clothing, housing, rent or mortgage or utilities. But this excludes emergency grant payments made over a period of up to three consecutive months to the provider of such items or services on behalf of an individual or family. Lastly, construction of new housing with some, ex some, some exceptions. And the final slide are a couple links for eligibility resources that are extremely useful and detailed. As we know, this is an overwhelming amount of information at one time. So in case any of you would like to double back on anything that's said about eligibility, you can check either of those. Next, uh, Bill will take us through the federal requirements. Great, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Austin or whoever is in control of the slides just to advance them whenever uh, I, uh, I'm done with the slides. So um, what I'd like to do is just take a few moments to uh, go over some of the, the strings that are attached to these federal dollars. If you've uh, worked with the CDBG program in the past or any federal grant program really, you know there's a lot of hoops you have to jump through in order to document that you're using the funds in the manner in which they were meant to be used. And uh, a part of uh, our role and job uh, with the city is to basically document that and make sure that everything is in the file. So, um, you know, before you decide to put a lot of work into uh, actually applying for these funds, we just want to make sure that you understand everything that comes with, uh, you know, receipt of these federal dollars. So we're going to go over written policies and procedures, uh, the environmental review process, as well as lead-based paint requirements. Um, special uh, conditions for procurement, property and asset management, audit requirements, and record keeping. So next slide, please. So uh, as a condition of receiving these funds, you need to have written policies and procedures in place, uh, adopted, and essentially being used by your organization in order to run whatever program you'd like to be funded. Uh, if you've worked with federal grant programs in the past, these are the same set of rules um, across lots of different federal agencies. Uh, they are under two CFR 200 of the uh, federal regulations. They're often referred to as the uniform administrative requirements. Um, and this is really just a, a really quick introduction to what's there. Um, if you want more information on what needs to be in your policies and procedures, please reach out. We can try to guide you in that direction. Um, but uh, they have to be written, number one. Absolutely, they have to be written. Um, that's, that's one of the standards. Uh, the rules are meant to basically cover, uh, especially your financial management standards. Um, and a large part of that is internal control. So what do we mean by internal control? We mean uh, basically segregation of duties. We need, mean uh, you know, proper uh, guardianship and uh, control over uh, any assets you have, uh, the processes, and, um, and making sure that your, your records are uh, accurate and, and timely. So you know, a big part of that is just real simple things. So uh, if you haven't done this yet, if you're a smaller agency and you have not yet put together right, written policies and procedures, this might be a good exercise for you just to really kind of lay out those strategies, lay out those, uh, you know, those things that you do on an everyday basis. They don't have to be hundreds of pages long. Uh, it can be a simple bullet point list. All we need to do is ensure that you have policies in place and, and how it all fits together. Uh, your policy should also cover your procurement. Um, 2 CFR 200 does uh, list out the uh, procurement policies that you need. They, keep in mind that 
a lot of the information, since these guidelines are so broad and meant to cover so many programs, uh, these are bare minimum standards. So a lot of times we'll see nonprofits uh, go far and above beyond what these requirements are, but they'll lay out basically uh, how to do a free and open competition, different levels of requirements. So if you're, you know, if you're buying a pack of pencils for an after school program, the requirements are going to be different than if you're trying to acquire a new building, right? So they kind of lay out the different uh, rules for the different types of procurement you might be doing. But again, uh, whatever program you are running would have to meet the bare minimum requirements of those procurement standards. Uh, cost principles. So we're talking about basically supporting, uh, num well, number one, what is eligible and allowable under the administrative requirements. Austin went through a really quick list about what's eligible under CDBG. Um, this cost principles is more about the line items under that. So, um, you know, if I have to pay for a staff person, what kind of records do I need to keep in terms of timesheets and payroll and all that? Um, it also talks about uh, direct costs versus indirect costs. So um, if you're not familiar with, um, you know, what's allowable, what's unallowable, um, you know, 2 CFR, 100, 2 CFR 200 is a good resource, or you can always call us and we will, uh, you know, provide you any kind of guidance you need. Most of the things you're looking for in terms of uh, property, equipment, um, staff salaries, paying the utilities, keeping the lights on, all of that is going to be eligible. Um, but if you have um, questions about that, again, please let us know. Property standards, just maintaining your property uh, and basically uh, real property standards and how, to, how long you need to use that real property. Record keeping and audit requirements. We'll, we'll touch on um, a few of these as we go forward. And again, as Edward mentioned, if you have any specific questions about these, please let us know at the end and we'll do our best to answer your questions. So uh, in addition to uh, basically those, those general written policies and procedures you need for, for, for financial management, this is a, uh, a selection of program policies. We think any program you're gonna fund is, is going to have in place. Again, you don't have to have these uh, all laid out by the time you apply, but when you're ready to go, these are things that you should have uh, pretty well in, in hand. Uh, number one, just applicant intake and eligibility determination. One of the big parts of these federal programs is making sure that we're serving the right types of people. So for CDBG, that usually means people who are at or below 80% of uh, area median income. So a lot of the times you will have to do some sort of income documentation. Uh, that's not 100% true for all programs. So for the homeless providers out there, um, there are presumptions where you don't have to collect income documentation if you're running certain types of programs. Again, if you have questions about, you know, the levels of documentation that you're going to need to collect, um, you know, please ask us because that can be, it can be a deal breaker. It really can, uh, depending on the type of program you're running. Uh, some of your other funding sources, for instance, may pro preclude you from collecting income documentation. So um, there's usually a way to work around it, but again, we, we need to know that ahead of time. And if you think you're going to have any problems with that, let us know. Uh, the rest are, are pretty straightforward. Uh, equal opportunity, non-discrimination, of course. Uh, you don't, we don't want any of that. Uh, if you are a faith-based organization, um, there may be, uh, we might want to take a closer look. Uh, you're, you're totally eligible and you'd be allowed to apply for these funds, but um, there are certain preclusions about uh, mixing uh, religious activities with uh, whatever program you want to fund. So we would want to talk those through. Conflict of interest. Uh, your conflict of interest policy, uh, and again, this is laid out fairly uh, detailed in that 2 CFR 200. Um, it should address uh, disciplinary actions for failures to uh, abide by that conflict of interest. Um, if you have a, if you are the parent organization or you are the subsidiary, subsidiary of a parent organization, uh, you have to address uh, that relationship as well. And finally, if you do have any conflict that uh, appears, or even uh, the appearance of a conflict of interest, uh, you'll, you're, as one of the, the clauses in the subrecipient agreement you'll uh, execute with the city, uh, it will require you to basically notify the city of any conflict. Um, and again, even if it's an apparent, we can go through that. We, can, we just have to document 
and uh, you know, make sure that the file shows uh, that everything was done correctly. Next slide, please. Okay, um, these are federal funds and every single dollar that uh, the city hands out is subject to environmental review. Uh, for those of you who are interested in a, obtaining funding for social services, the environmental review is very simple, very easy. It uh, takes just a few days. Uh, the city just has to do a couple of uh, pieces of paperwork. Um, know that the environmental re uh, review is primarily the responsibility of the city, but especially on capital improvement projects or anything that's gonna move a lot of dirt around, uh, it's gonna require a lot of close uh, coordination in terms of this, you know, number one, just, you know, deciding on what is the scope uh, of what you're doing and, uh, you know, any type of mitigation efforts that uh, will be required if we do come up with any environmental issues. Um, the one big thing I wanna say for environmental review is, you know, please, 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 if you, are no, if you receive notification from the city that you have been awarded funds or the city is going to process an award for you, don't take what's called a choice limiting action um, before the completion of the review because that can basically uh, revoke the award and the city would no longer be able to use federal funds to fund your program. So uh, if you're really biting at the bit, uh, ready to go um, and you need to go fast, uh, that's fine, just communicate that with the city, but please, please, please do not get going um, and, and that includes a lot of things. That includes hiring uh, contractors. That includes, uh, you know, basically finalizing designs and standards. Uh, and, and again, I'm mostly talking about capital improvement projects. If you're just doing uh, a program, which is a social service, all you're doing is you're not really moving dirt or affecting any properties, anything physical. Um, the environmental review is very simple. But uh, again, just don't, don't uh, start as soon as you can, just make sure you're in clear communication with, uh, with the city. Uh, Lead-based paint, anytime you're doing a housing program, uh, lead-based paint is going to uh, rear its ugly head. There's lots of different rules uh, regarding lead-based paint. Um, even if you're just uh, renting units, there's still some lead paint requirements, including uh, notification and disclosure. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the details of it, but um, essentially, if you're doing any sort of rehab, there's gonna be a notification um, of, of basically lead uh, potential uh, hazards, um, assessment, whether you're testing the property for the presence of lead paint, or if you're making a presumption. Again, the lead paint, um, it, it was basically an issue with housing built before 1978. Um, and given the housing age of the housing stock in Fresno, you know, it's, it's going to be an issue if you decide to do any housing program. So, you know, just keep that in mind as, as you uh, fill out your, your applications. So we have the pre-work and then once the work is uh, started, and again, this is going to apply for any housing programs. Even if you're working with all volunteers, this is something you're going to need to consider in your program design. So uh, under work, we're, we're dealing with lead safe work practices. Um, if you go over a certain dollar amount that you want to invest in a property, um, you might have to do something called in interim controls where you're basically trying to prevent any lead paint on the house from uh, becoming a threat uh, all the way up to abatement where you're actually removing the lead paint threat from the unit uh, and that can get very expensive. Um, and again, if you have any questions about what those thresholds are, if you're interested in doing a rehab program, let us know and we'll try to answer those questions as best as possible. And then finally, once all the work is done, if there was lead paint or a presumption of lead paint, you'll also have to do some clearance testing just to make sure that uh, that lead paint is not now a threat due to the rehab. So, okay, moving on. Most of this uh, will apply to everybody. Uh, procurement, anytime you're doing uh, capital projects that are involving laborers and mechanics, um, for the federal threshold, it's $2,000, so it's very, very low. And then with the state, I don't even believe there's a dollar amount. Basically, anytime you're funding something with uh, public funds, which CDBG funds would qualify as, uh, ESG and HAPO as well, we're going to need to deal with prevailing wages. Um, this can be um, administratively difficult. The city will help you and help you with that monitoring of uh, prevailing wages. Uh, but no, 
uh, from your side when budgeting that prevailing wages can really increase the cost of a project as well. Uh, basically, what we're saying here is we have to pay uh, union rates for all labor and mechanics on these types of projects. Again, this is really limited to capital projects. So if you're just doing a social service, you're not doing a capital projects, don't worry about that. The other three will apply to all, uh, including social service projects, uh, in any basically type of procurement. Um, minority and women owned business outreach. Um, you wanna document the outreach and other efforts to make sure that when you do any type of procurement, you're, uh, you're essentially making sure that any uh, qualified women-owned businesses or minority-owned businesses uh, are aware of the opportunity and you give them a fair chance to uh, participate. That uh, same regulation I cited before, 2 CFR 200, it has a section uh, on minority and women business outreach and things you can do to basically make those um, more accessible to them. And again, you, you don't have to do it for every single procurement, um, but um, for the larger procurements, like if you're, again, you're going out to buy a box of pencils, you don't have to look for minority and women owned businesses. But if it's a larger um, procurement, then that's when you'd wanna go out and do a little bit more due diligence. Section three is a rule um, that applies to all the, the especially CDBG, but ESG and HOPLA as well. I, let me, I might need to double check on that, but I'm fairly sure it applies to all three. Uh, basically, what this does is where there is a contractor involved uh, and they are going to need to either hire uh, more employees or subcontractors to basically complete the scope of work that is being funded, that they are going to uh, try to maximize to the maximum extent feasible uh, job opportunities for lower income people in the projects area. The city currently partners with um, a couple different organizations, uh, specifically uh, Hope Builds. They do section three training. So uh, we can always uh, pass on those opportunities to uh, Hope Builds and see if they have people who are uh, you know, able, willing, and uh, you know, to, to partner with whatever contractors you select. But um, just know that this is going to uh, be another uh, what they call a cross-cutting requirement where if, uh, if you're hiring contractors, section three is going to apply. It doesn't apply to every single procurement. Um, I believe it's only for contracts over $100,000, but they also have language in there about maximum extent feasible. So we want to kind of extend that down and, and really if there are job opportunities for lower income persons due to uh, this type of work funded with these programs, we wanna make those opportunities available to them. The final one is really uh, just a piece of paperwork, but we, again, we need to do it. We need to make sure our files are complete. Uh, anytime you work with a contractor, um, <clears throat> that you do a debarment suspension check. Um, I believe it's on sams.gov. All you do is you go to the website, you search for that contractor you wanna work with. Um, and if they're listed, you can't use them. You have to go on to your next uh, lowest bid, lowest qualified bid. If they aren't listed, you just basically print out that piece of paper or that website and uh, show that they're not the the one you selected is not the bar. Moving on. So property asset management. If you guys ever, if you are using funds to basically improve a property or to purchase a property, construct a property, anything with real property, um, and it's above twenty five thousand dollars that um, that property needs to be used to meet a CDBG national objective for at least five years. Um, for those of you who are interested in applying for ESG, and we, we should have included this, uh, this bit here too, the minimum is 10 years. You need to basically maintain the use of that building for 10 years anytime you're doing capital improvements to a shelter. Um, for equipment, it's the same thing. Uh, I would just note that equipment and supplies um, you know, it, we were using uh, HUD's definition and the federal definition of equipment. Um, for that, it's uh, equipment is useful life for more than one year and the per unit acquisition cost is $5,000. These are the HUD's, uh, the federal standards. Uh, if you have lower standards, so let's say you buy a laptop and you consider that a piece of equipment under your own rules, 
we would want you to see uh, use that uh, that equipment for at least five years. Uh, you also need to have basically controls in place to make sure that you're monitoring the use of that equipment and making sure it's being used for the same purpose uh, the city originally funded for. So that means you're going to have to have some sort of inventory control to prevent against loss, theft, and other policies to make sure that it's continued to use for that same policy, uh, the same original purpose. Next slide, please. Audit requirements, most of you, this probably will not apply, but anytime you spend more than $750,000 in a single year, and that uh, the key word there is expense, um, basically you're going to be subject to uh, the audit requirements of 2 CFR 200. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into all the details, but essentially, uh, and this can be expensive as well, uh, you need to, uh, select an auditor to perform an audit, either on your organization or on a single program. Um, and on completion of that audit, you would submit it to the city, you would submit it to the Federal Audit Clearinghouse. And if uh, the selected program, the funded program, uh, had any findings, then the city would have to follow up with you. If you're below that $750,000 threshold, uh, essentially you just have to, at the end of your, whatever your fiscal year is, You'll just submit a letter to the city saying, uh, for the year fiscal year closing on yada, 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 we did not reach $750,000 of federal expenses for the year. And that's it, and you're done. So um, I know some of the, the subrecipients that the city works with, some of the larger ones, they do have this. Um, but uh, if you're a smaller agency, you shouldn't have to worry about it. Next slide, please. Okay, record keeping. Um, this is one of the bigger areas where um, I, I've been doing this for 20 years and you know this whenever I see a monitoring finding usually poor record keeping is to blame. Um, half the time they did everything right, the agency did everything right, they just did not keep the proper records to show and document that uh, they did everything right. So um, and, and, and we wanna to try to prevent that as much as possible. So having really good record keeping, um, having project file checklists, um, having an extra set of eyes go through all your record keeping, um, it takes an extra time, but in the end, it's worth it just to make sure that um, you never have to repay these funds and the city never has to repay these funds either. Um, so just some general keeping, uh, record keeping notes. Um, number one, make sure that all your record keeping, especially personally identifiable information um, it's uh, subject to safeguards, it's in a locked office, it's in a locked cabinet, only certain select people have uh, access to those files. Uh, the same thing for any electronic files. Um, I will warn you that if you are collecting a lot of personal identifiable information, um, the city is also looking at your insurance requirements to make sure that you have adequate coverage for any kind of liability there. Um, in terms of how long you need to keep the records, you'll need to keep them for at least four years after closeout, um, except in the following circumstances where the record retention would actually be longer, um, and that's where you're, you're purchasing property or improvements. And again, we talked about that five-year threshold, so at least for five years. Uh, if there's any outstanding monitoring or litigation, um, and basically, for that four-year period, uh, you'll have to provide, and again, this is going to be a clause in your subrecipient agreement, uh, you'll have to provide access uh, to the city and any designated officials from HUD or any other federal agencies that, that need to look at those files. Next slide, please. One quick note on ESG match uh, for those applying, thinking of applying for the ESG funds. Um, this is one area where the city has been dinged in the past for monitoring, so I wanted to make a special note. But, um, you know, you have to do a really good job of documenting what is being used as a match for ESG. Um, in the last couple of years, I believe the city has been able to, um, you know, easily meet these requirements with other funding sources, especially city funds. But um, if you are required to match the dollars you get for ESG, just keep the following in mind. Um, you have to document both the source and use of the match. Uh, the record must indicate the particular fiscal year 
uh, that the matching contribution is counted. So if you have uh, uh, an award from last year still underway and a, a new one for the new year, just make sure you, you properly document which award that match is counting towards. Uh, you have to basically show your math in terms of how you are valuing um, non-cash contributions. So have some kind of, you know, whether it's volunteers or worth $10 an hour or this food, uh, the market value is yada, 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 based on this expert's opinion. You know, just make sure you have documentation in terms of how you're calculating that match amount. Um, let's keep going. All right, Austin, I believe you are going to take the lead on these, but um, let me know if you want me to chime in on anything. Yeah, uh, that sounds good. I could, I could take it from here. Uh, we're going to go over now the reimbursement process for your public activity programs. The reimbursement process entails a transfer of grant funds to the subrecipient based on actual expenditures by the subrecipient before the request is made for funds. The request is reviewed by grantee staff who will then determine if documentation, including receipts, invoices, canceled checks, whichever charges you deem sufficient, uh, as sufficient or additional documentation is needed. Reimbursements are processed within 30 days of receiving a complete reimbursement package. So this means there is any discrepancies with that invoice, but the 30 days does not officially began because the submitted documentation is not up to par just yet. Okay, next we have uh, financial management. This is establishing and maintaining a financial system, both that serves your agency's needs and meets the federal requirements, is essential to avoid overspent budgets or serious audit findings. Now, Bill previously went over most of these, but uh, just to reiterate, some of the required elements of financial systems for managing federal funds is internal controls, accounting records, allowable costs, source documentation, budget controls and cash management, financial reporting, and the uh, link below has detailed explanations of each of these that you can use whenever you click. All right, thank you, Bill and Austin. Um, so next, uh, we are going to go over the application process uh, and the timeline for the application process and the resources that will be available to you during the application process. And then afterwards, we will have um, a Q&A session. So the application process is presented in detail in the 2020-2021 Consolidated NOFA Handbook, which is available on the website of the Housing and Community Development Division under the tab Notice of Funding Available. To the right of the page, you'll find links to all of the application materials included in the 2020-2021 Consolidated NOFA. The first link is the handbook and that contains much of the information provided in this presentation along with a lot more. A lot of useful appendices and summaries are attached to that as well. It's strongly recommended that you read uh, the handbook in detail prior to beginning your application. On that list below the consolidated NOFA handbook, there are multiple links there and those are the individual applications which you'll download, complete, and submit. Every organization will be submitting one NOFA application part A um, and one or more NOFA application part B. So part A essentially tells us information about your organization. Part B is telling us which programs you're applying for. So you can have more than one part B application, uh, but you still just need one part A. And then for each part B, you'll also submit um, a NOFA operating budget summary workbook. And that's an Excel workbook that you can download and complete based on our template. It's also in the part B application um, in uh, sort of a word format. Um, and it's okay if, if you're more comfortable with that as well. It's just a lot easier to use with the Excel documents. So we've made that available just directly on the website this year. So the first item on the list is the NOFA application part A. 
Every organization must complete that along with all required attachments. And we've provided a list of some of the requirements to this attachment here on this slide, um, because we know that some of them may take more time than others for eligible organizations to collect. Um, and those uh, include uh, some of these, which Austin's already identified, the 501c3 IRS determination of exemption letter, your articles of incorporation and bylaws, uh, statements and designation by foreign corporation, that's if you're an out of state uh, corporation, not sure if we have any of those folks on the call. Um, list of directors and officers, most recent audited financial statements, uh, cost allocation, uh, cost allocation plan, rather, if you're planning to charge an indirect cost rate that's greater than 10% of the modified total indirect, uh, total direct cost, rather, if that's part of your application, then we do need a detailed explanation in a cost allocation plan for how you arrived at that cost allocation um, plan there. And finally, a resolution of the board of directors authorizing the application and naming the person or persons authorized to sign the application. And we know that that one might take a little bit longer for some of these organizations uh, to acquire. So the deadline for that one is by July 7th, 2020. So after the deadline for the NOPA, but before we've made um, our recommendations and done our scoring. The application part B includes all of the information regarding the specific program for which you're asking for funding. Organizations may submit one or more part B applications depending on the types and number of programs they're applying for. Uh, we do say here on this slide that each application should only include one program. Uh, but if you're unsure about whether you should submit one or more applications for any given set of programs, please contact the program manager listed in the NOFA handbook for guidance. You know, for example, there might be different programs, uh, for different program managers, maybe different locations, but really it's one large umbrella that's over that program and maybe it would make more sense for it to be submitted as a single application. So if there's any uncertainty in your mind, please reach out to us and let us know and we'll let you know um, whether you should submit one or two Part B applications or more. Click on there. So some of the required attachments for this application, which may take some time for you to collect, include a program level operating budget summary, prior year program level financial statements, which are required for existing programs, and service area maps. That is unless you're able to adequately define the service area just in the narrative of your Part B application. Um, so, you know, if it's something like a quarter mile radius from this address, that's probably sufficient in the narrative. But if you have, if your service area is irregular for your program, um, then, uh, then we'll want you to submit a service area map as well. So the tentative timeline for the NOPA process is provided on this slide. Um, please note that some dates are subject to change. As discussed earlier, we have received approval to submit the plans to HUD from City Council. That was on May 21st, 2020. And then we very rapidly released the NOFA the very next day. Of course, we have several webinars available, which many of you have already registered for, including this one. Um, applications are due to the City on June 22nd, 2020. And after that, the City will score the applications. So City staff will score the applications based on the uh, score sheet that is attached to each one of those applications. So it's very transparent exactly how uh, we're scoring those applications. But the city will score those applications upon receipt and with a target date of July 7th, uh, make recommendations. The consolidated plan and annual action plan are expected to be approved by HUD on July 20th, 2020. And on August 20th, 2020, that's the target date that we're currently looking at uh, to get on the city council agenda with all of the subrecipient agreements uh, that would arise out of this NOFA process. Following that, the city will issue notices of grant awards or NOGAs, uh, which require, there's a small process there where you'll give us a little bit more information and, and we'll collect some signatures from you as well. I want to note that this year's timeline was impacted by not only the fact that it is a five-year consolidated plan, which as we've discussed has some impacts on the timeline, 
but also by the COVID-19 pandemic, which delayed the uh, public hearings uh, for the adoption of our consolidated plan by, I wanna say almost a month and a half. Um, as a result, the city is making every effort to move as quickly as possible to ensure that subrecipients receive reimbursements, um, contracts as early as possible. As in years past, applications are due by 4 p.m. on the submission deadline. Uh, postmarks are not accepted. Organizations are asked to submit one signed application and one digital copy of their application. Uh, organizations are encouraged to mail their applications in advance of the deadline. Um, and we recommend that you call or email us to let, to let us know that they're on the way. If you are planning to deliver your application in person, please contact us uh, 24 hours in advance to arrange receipt. On account of the COVID-19 pandemic, things are changing very fast. So we wanna make sure that we can coordinate with you to ensure the success of that delivery. So if you're delivering in person, make sure to call us at least 24 hours in advance. And that can be at the 621-8300 number that you see here. Um, or you can also reach out directly to your program manager. Um, organizations have three options for submitting digitally this year, which include uh, first emailing hcdd at fresno.gov. A lot of people prefer that because you've got a solid record of the, of the transmittal. Um, but unfortunately, that only works if the size of your application is less than 40 megabytes. Uh, so limits on the city server space, uh, restrict us from accepting files that are larger than that. So if you uh, are unable to email, or if you prefer not to email, you can submit a flash drive with your um, submission, with your physical submission. Um, or you can also use the city's FTP upload tool. Um, and that sounds intimidating, but the instructions are very simple and they're included in the um, NOFA handbook. Um, what you essentially do is you click on a link and then you'll upload your document and it'll give you a link that you'll then paste into an email and email to us. Um, and that also sort of preserves, you've got a record of your submittal in your outbox if you go that way as well. Um, again, we strongly recommend that you contact the program manager for your application upon submission. And we will be confirming applications, application submissions as we receive them to the email addresses that are provided. Um, so if you don't hear a confirmation from us regarding your submitted application within about one business day, then we strongly recommend you send us an email at hcdd at fresno.gov. And uh, I'd also recommend calling the 559-621-8300 number. Additional support is available. Uh, applicants may schedule one-on-one -on -one consultations with the program managers for the period from June 8th to June 12th. So please contact your program managers in advance if you'd like to have an individual consultation with them. Uh, we highly recommend it. These uh, program managers are, 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 are there to help and they know a lot about these programs and, and can probably help save you some time and, and effort if you give them a call in advance and schedule a one-on-one -on -one session. Uh, for owner-occupied home repair programs, contact Erica Castaneda at erica.castaneda at fresno.gov. For homeless and homelessness prevention, contact Erica Lopez at erica.lopez at fresno.gov. And for public and community services, contact Austin. We've been hearing from today at austin.robinson at fresno.gov. For general inquiries, um, please shoot an email over to hcdd at fresno.gov. And I monitor that inbox uh, quite frequently. So uh, please feel free to use that if you have any questions that you're not sure where to go for. Uh, additional support, we also recommend that you bookmark the Notice of Funding Availability tab on the Housing and Community Development Division website. We're really trying to keep that as up to date as possible this year. Um, check back often for updates. The address is fresno.gov forward slash housing forward slash hashtag tab dash o2 or go to fresno.gov slash housing click on notice of funding availability that's a little easier email hcdd at fresno.gov as i said um, if you haven't already uh, signed up for the our uh, distribution list to receive notices when we have 
updates regarding planning efforts um, or things like this where we issue the notice of funding availability. We send a big email blast quite frequently for those, uh, those types of things to uh, our stakeholder list that we maintain. Uh, so if you're not already on that list, if you didn't receive the notices, please shoot us an email at hcdd at fresno.gov and just put join in the subject line and we'll know what that means and get you signed up to receive those updates on an ongoing basis. And finally, of course, we'll see you, uh, see many of you at the upcoming webinars as we know that many of you have already signed up for those. All right, and with that, we will open it up for questions. Um, so the uh, protocol here, if you would like to ask a question um, and are signed into the Zoom application, you can add yourself to the queue by selecting the icon labeled participants at the bottom center of your screen. In the window that opens, you'll click the label raise hand. If you are joined by phone, select star nine to be added to the queue. We will unmute you in turn so that you can ask your questions. All right, and with that, we will hold and wait and see if we have any raised digital hands. <coughs> All right, uh, seeing no questions then, um, we will go ahead and conclude. If you do have a question, um, and for whatever reason, um, I believe we've got the technology working correctly here, um, but you were unable to ask the question, please uh, shoot us an email at hcdd at fresno.gov or contact your program manager. Um, and with that, we thank you. Uh, any parting words? No, we, let me drop my mask here for a second. We thank you for joining us today. Um, we're also interested in your feedback on, on uh, how this went for you, from, from your point of view, uh, and uh, what we did well, what we could do better, and we will take that feedback to heart and, uh, and uh, implement some of it, if possible, down the line. So uh, feel free to do that, and, uh, and we may put together a little feedback form that we send out and ask you to send back to us complete, and it would be without without renew, uh, penalty, should you be critical of us. So with that, I give it back to Ed. All right, thank you everybody. And I know we're gonna see you getting done a little bit early here. Uh, we'll see many of you at three o'clock for the public services presentation. Again, thanks for joining and have a good afternoon.